Good morning. Today is Sunday, September 20th. We gather to worship God and celebrate the resurrection. I'm glad you're here. I have a few announcements before we begin. Unless it's raining, we will hold a brief service of Holy Communion in our church grove at 945 this morning. If you're watching or listening to this early enough, I invite you to join us. We will continue to do this, weather permitting, through October 18th. Two special things about today's online service. Yesterday we celebrated the holy baptism of Maverick William Baggett outside in our church grove. And a portion of that baptism will be part of today's online liturgy. Because it was filmed outside without amplification, the sound quality isn't perfect, and I apologize for that. Also, we are currently in the middle of a special time in the church year, sometimes called the season of creation. This is a time in September and October when some congregations choose to focus on caring for creation. A special service was created for this by the organization Lutherans Restoring Creation. You can search for Lutherans Restoring Creation on YouTube to, to view the whole service. Uh, I will also be including portions of that service in our worship today and in the next two weeks. Thanks to all who have already contributed to our Backpack Buddies program that we're helping Slater Family Network with. Uh, we will continue to collect items for that for the next two weeks. And finally, we had a nice turnout yesterday uh, at Rally Day for our, our children, children's program we're calling Zoom Zone. If you'd like your children to participate in Zoom Zone and couldn't be at Rally Day, please contact Brenda Hughes or myself uh, ASAP. Let us begin our worship together with the prelude. I am so grateful that I am able at this point to contribute to Lutheran's Restoring Creation, and I hope that your vision of Restoring Creation might not only be a season, but at the very heart of what we celebrate whenever we gather. So righteous one, come and bring our love to birth in the glory of your Son. Sing out earth and sky, sing of the God who loves you. Raise your joyful cries, dance to the light around you. Come, O oh God of wind and flame, fill the earth with righteousness. Teach us all to sing your name, may our lives your love confess. Sing out earth and sky, sing of the God who loves you. Raise your joyful cries, dance to the life around you. Come, O oh God of flashing light, twinkling star and burning sun. God of day and God of night, in your light we all are one. Sing out earth and sky, sing of the God who loves you. Raise your joyful cries, dance to the light around you. Come, O oh God of snow and rain, shower down upon the earth. Come, O oh God of joy and pain, God of sorrow, God of the God who loves you, raise your joyful cries, dance to the life around you. Come, O oh justice, come, O oh peace, come and shape our hearts anew. Come and make oppression cease, bring us all to life in you. Sing our earth and sky, sing of the God who loves you. Raise your joyful cries, dance to the light around you. Sing out earth and skies, sing of the God who loves you. Raise your joyful cries, dance to the light around you.
Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who creates, redeems, and sustains us and all of creation. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Faithful God, have mercy on us. We confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We turn from your loving embrace and go our own ways. We pass judgment on one another before examining ourselves. We place our own needs before those of our neighbors. We keep your gift of salvation to ourselves. Make us humble, cast away our transgressions, and turn us again to life in you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God hears the cries of all who are in need, and through his death and resurrection, Christ has made us his own. Hear the truth that God proclaims. Your sins are forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. Led by the Holy Spirit, live in freedom and newness to do God's work in the world. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Creator of life, of relationships, of healing. At your word, the earth brought forth plants yielding seed and trees of every kind bearing fruit. Through the planetary cycles of renewal and growth, you open your hand and give creatures our food. But these days, our living pushes the planet beyond its limits. During this season of creation, we ask you to grant us courage to observe a Sabbath for our planet. Teach us to be satisfied with enough. And as we proclaim a jubilee for the earth, send your Holy Spirit to renew the face of creation. In the name of the one who came to proclaim good news to all creation, Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Did you know that autumn starts this week? No. It does. Do you know what autumn brings with it every year? No. What happens in the autumn? Do you want, do you know another name for autumn? I no I did. Fall. Fall starts this week. And what happens in the fall? The leaves fall from the trees. And you know what a lot of people are going to be doing in the next month or two with those leaves? Raking. Raking them, yes. Do you think that raking leaves is hard work? Yeah. yeah. I think it's pretty easy work in the beginning, but I think the more you do it, the harder it gets. Well, today's story is about some people who worked very hard and got paid for it. They were working in what's called a vineyard, but we're going to pretend they were raking leaves instead. So Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out first thing in the morning to find people to rake all his leaves for him. And he found you. And he said, I'll give you $20 if you rake my leaves. It'll probably take all day. And so you went out and started raking. Here's, let's pretend this is a rake, all right? So pretend that you're raking, all right? Rake all those leaves up. Oops. Well, about six hours later, you're still working. And you see that the landowner went out to find other workers. And he told them, you go out and rake too, and I'll pay you whatever's, whatever's right. And they joined you, and you had some friends raking with you then. Was that nice? Well, about five hours after that, you're still working. And he went out again, and he found even more people. He said, you go out and rake too. And they joined you too. So now, about 12 hours after you started, it's quitting time. How are you feeling? After 12 hours of raking, how do you feel? Terrible. Terrible? I bet you feel pretty tired, yeah. So you can put your rake down. Well, the boss calls all of you over to get your money. First, 
He goes to the ones who started at the end of the day, who only raked for about an hour or so. He said, thank you for working one hour. Here's $20. And then the ones who worked half a day came, and he said, thank you for working six hours. Here's $20. And then finally you. He said, thank you for working 12 hours. Here's $20. And how would you feel about that? Surprised that everybody got the same amount of money, right? And weird. Well, in the story Jesus told, the ones who started working first weren't just surprised. They got angry. And they grumbled and said, this isn't fair. But here's what the landowner said to them. He said, friend, I didn't cheat you. I paid you exactly what we agreed upon, remember? I chose to give them the same amount, and I have the right to do that. Don't be jealous just because I'm generous. I'm giving you all exactly what you need to live. That's a weird story, isn't it? Yeah. Well, thank you for your help. Thank you for practicing raking so when, uh, when the leaves fall at our house, you can do all the raking there, right? Not all. Not all of it, maybe some of it. Mm -hmm. All right, let's bow our heads for a prayer. Dear God, Dear God, thank you for giving us work to do. Thank you for giving us work to do. And thank you for giving us all we need. Amen. 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 The first reading is a reading from Jonah. After Jonah's short sermon in chapter 3, verse 4, the Ninevites all repented and God decided to spare the city. Jonah objected to this and became even more angry when God ordered a worm to destroy a plant that was providing shade. The book ends with a question that challenges any who are not ready to forgive. You, Jonah, and all are worked up about a bush, but shouldn't I be concerned about 120,000 Ninevites? When God saw what the people of Nineveh did, how they turned from their evil ways. God had second thoughts about the calamity that God said would be done to them, and God did not do it. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I sa said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning, for I knew that you are gracious God, and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Is it right for you to be so angry? Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. O Lord God, appointed, the Lord God pointed, appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give shade over his head and save him from being discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush so that it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint and asked that he might die. He said, Is it better for me to die than to live? But God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry at about a bush? And he said, Yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, You are concerned about the bush, for which you did not labor, and which you did not grow. It came into being in the night, and perished in the night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh? the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who did not know their right hand from their left and also many animals? The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I will extol you, my God and King. And bless your name forever and ever. Thank you. 
Every day I will bless you. And praise your name forever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. God's greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall allow your works to another, and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty, and on your wondrous works. I will meditate. The might of your awesome deeds shall be proclaimed, and I will declare your greatness. They shall celebrate the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful. Slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. The second reading is from Philippians. Paul writes to the Philippians from prison. Though he is uncertain about the outcome of his imprisonment, he is committed to the ministry of the gospel and calls on the Philippians to live lives that reflect and enhance the gospel mission. For to me, living in Christ and dying is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which I prefer. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and to be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you. Since I am convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy in life and faith, so that I may share abundantly in your boasting in Christ Jesus when I come to you again. Only live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent and hear about you, I will know that you are standing firm in one spirit, striving side by side with one mind for the faith and the gospel, and are in no way intimidated by your opponents. For them, this is evidence that their destruction, but of of your salvation. And this is doing God's doing, for God has graciously granted you the privilege not only to in believing of believing in Christ, but of suffering for Christ as well, since you are having the same struggle that you saw I had and now hear that I still have the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, you also go into the vineyard and I'll pay you whatever is right. So they went. Well, he went out again about noon and about three o'clock and he did the same. 
And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, why are you standing idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. Well, when those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more. But each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner saying, these last worked only one hour and you've made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to them, friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to the last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. The Gospel of the Lord. This is one of the most realistic stories that Jesus ever told, and perhaps one of the most important. It was realistic because in first century Israel, this kind of thing happened. People would gather every morning in the marketplace in the center of town. These were day laborers, people looking for work, people who didn't have a steady job, but who hoped that someone would hire them just for the day to work in their field or vineyard or some other job. It was the original gig economy. These people weren't quite destitute or impoverished, but they certainly lived hand to mouth. More than a few days without work, and they'd be in serious trouble. Well, the other realistic thing about the story is that the manager kept going back and hiring more and more people as the day went on. The work had to be done on a schedule, and the manager may have miscalculated at first just how many workers were needed. But then the realism falls apart, right at the part where we all got a little anxious, when the workers got paid, when all the workers, the ones who had worked all day long and the ones who had only worked an hour or two, when all of them received the same pay. That wasn't realistic. That wouldn't have happened. It just wasn't fair. However, think about it. It is realistic, isn't it? Flip it around. Instead of thinking about workers receiving the same pay for different hours, think about re workers receiving different pay for the same hours. Now that is realistic. Even today, a woman earns on average 82 cents for every dollar a man earns. A black man earns 87 cents on average for every dollar a white man earns. It's not fair. And beyond that, there is a lot that's unfair about life. You know that. You've learned that the hard way. Life isn't fair. So perhaps the unfairness at the heart of this story just makes it even more realistic. It's sad. But what's even more sad here, what's downright terrifying, is that Jesus says this is a parable for the kingdom of heaven. Now remember, that doesn't mean the afterlife. The kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is God's reign here on earth what things look like when God is in charge. Well, Jesus tells us that when God's in charge, things are unfair. Jesus tells us that God is unfair. And thank God for that. Thank God for that, because if God were fair, well, then we would all get what we deserve. 
We would all get what we deserve. Here's what a world in which God were fair would look like. It might look something like climbing a mountain. Imagine a mountain that reaches from us on the ground all the way up to God in heaven. And the harder we work, the harder we climb. The more good things we do, the, hard, the higher we climb. And the higher we climb, the closer we are to God. However, everything bad we do, every sin, knocks us back down that mountain a little. Now, if God were fair, we would get exactly what we deserve based on how high up the mountain we are. The higher we are, the bigger a mansion in heaven we'd receive. The higher we are, the more happiness we'd get here on earth. And so we would work hard, so hard to make sure that we are climbing that mountain, never slipping down. But sooner or later, you know what we would notice? We'd notice that this mountain is big. Bigger than we ever thought. So big it touches the heavens themselves and we would realize that no matter how hard we climb, no matter how high we go, we're no closer to God than when we started. We're still at the very beginning. And if God were fair, well, none of us would fare very well. The good news is that God is not fair. The good news is there is no mountain. The good news is that we do reach God. We do reach God, but not because we go up. It's because God comes down. God comes down to meet us where we are. God comes down to meet us in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, ground level. The cross was planted firmly in the ground. And Jesus rose up from the ground on the third day, bringing all of us with him. There's no need for a mountain that reaches to God, because God has come to us. God is here. And the grace that we receive is not in proportion to what we have done, but in proportion to what Christ has done. And Christ has done enough. God provides for us all, no exceptions, no ifs, ands, or buts. It's grace. God's love freely given. It's all grace. And here's the really cool thing. Take a closer look at the landowner in this story, and a closer look at the workers. Whom does the landowner represent in the story? God, right? Yes. So if the landowner is God, then the landowner could have taken care of that vineyard like that. He didn't need workers. Think about that. Nonetheless, the landowner went out. He went to the marketplace. He came down to where the people were. And what did he see there? He saw people in need. People standing in the marketplace, waiting, waiting, waiting because they needed something. They needed money. And they also needed purpose. They needed meaning in their lives. They needed a job to do to give their life direction. And he provided all that for them. He promised those first workers, I will give you the work you need. And I will give you the money you need. And he did. And he promised those last workers, I will give you the work you need, and I will give you the money you need. And he did. In this story, that money is not a paycheck. It's grace. And the work is grace as well. The landowner gave them work because he loved them, and gave them money because he loved them. It's all grace. And so the funny thing is, those first workers did actually get more, in a way. They got the same amount of money, and they also got the chance to work in the kingdom even longer. Because the thing is, working for God's kingdom isn't a painful trek up a mountain. 
Oh, it can be hard work, but think about people who spend their whole lives following a rock band like the Grateful Dead because they find such meaning and joy in their concerts. It's like that, only better. Think about storm chasers, those people who drive so close to tornadoes because they find such exhilaration and meaning in being so close to the power of nature. It's like that, only better. Think about following a rainbow to a pot of gold that you know is at the end. It's like that, only better. Following Christ can be hard work, but it's the most meaningful thing we can do. It brings joy to our lives. It brings hope to our lives. It brings meaning and purpose to our lives. God is calling you to do this work. God is calling you to be part of the kingdom of God. God is calling you to follow and work in the vineyard too. God is giving you a job, giving you the opportunity for a life with meaning and purpose. Maybe this doesn't sound realistic, but it's the most real thing there is. Jesus said that God is giving us all what we need to live. That's grace. It's not fair, but it's good. And it's real. And that is very, very good. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy and love, gives us a new birth into a living hope through the sacrament of baptism. By water and the word, God delivers us from sin and death and raises us up to new life in Jesus Christ. We are united with all the baptized in the body of Christ, anointed with the gift of the Holy Spirit, and joined in God's mission for the life of the world. Who presents this child for baptism? God, parents, please respond. We do. We do. Called by the Holy Spirit, trusting in the grace and love of God, do you desire to have Maverick William baptized into Christ? If so, answer, we do. Yeah. Do you promise to help Maverick grow in the Christian faith and life? If so, answer, we do. Yeah. Godparents, do you promise to nurture Maverick in the Christian faith as you are empowered by God's Spirit? And to help him live in the covenant of baptism and in communion with the church? If so, answer, we do. Yeah. People of God, do you promise to support Maverick and pray for him in his new life in Christ? If so, answer together, we do. We do. Maverick, you have lots of people praying for you. I ask you now... <laughs> Good. I ask you to profess your faith in Christ Jesus, reject sin, and confess the faith of the church. To the parents and sponsors, do you renounce the devil and all the forces that defy God, the powers of this world that rebel against God, and the ways of the world that, do, that draw you from God? If so, answer, I renounce them. And to all gathered here, do you believe in God the Father, Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth? If so, say, I believe. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried, who descended to the dead, who on the third day rose again, who ascended into heaven? who is seated at the right hand of the Father and who will come to judge the living and the dead? If so, answer, I believe. I believe. Do you believe in God, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting? If so, answer, I believe. I believe. The Lord be with you. 
let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Holy God, holy and merciful, holy and mighty, you are the river of life. You are the everlasting wellspring. You are the fire of rebirth. Glory to you for oceans and lakes, for rivers and streams. Honor to you for cloud and rain, for dew and snow. Your waters are below us, around us, above us. Our life is born in you. You are the fountain of resurrection. Praise to you for your saving waters. Noah and the animals survive the flood. Hagar discovers your well. The Israelites escape through the sea and they drink from your gushing rock. Naaman washes his leprosy away and the Samaritan woman will never be thirsty again. At this font, holy God, we pray. Praise to you for the water of baptism and for your word that saves us in this water. Breathe your spirit into all who are gathered here and, to, and into all creation. Illumine our days, enliven our bones, dry our tears. Wash away the sin within us and drown the evil around us. Satisfy all our thirst with your living water, Jesus Christ, our Savior who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. You can bring him over here. Maverick William, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. We give you thanks, O God, that through water and the Holy Spirit you give your daughters and sons new birth, cleanse them from sin, and raise them to eternal life. Sustain Maverick with the gift of your Holy Spirit, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, the spirit of joy in your presence, both now and forever. Amen. Maverick William, child of God, you have been sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked with the cross of Christ forever. Amen. Let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Drawn together in the compassion of God, we pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Generous God, you make the last first and the first last. Where this gospel challenges the church, equip it for its works of service. Strengthen those who suffer for Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Sun and wind, bushes and worms, cattle and great cities, nothing in creation is outside your concern. Mighty God, in your mercy, tend to it all. Give us a spirit of generosity toward all you have made. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Where we find envy and create enemies, you provide enough for all. Bring peace to places of conflict and violence. Inspire leaders with creativity and wisdom. Bless the word of negotiators, peacemakers, and development workers. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Reveal yourself to all in need, as you are gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, ready to relent from punishing, accompanying judges and lawyers, victims of crime, and those serving sentences. Give fruitful labor and a life livelihood to those seeking work. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Even beyond our expectations, you choose to give generously. Grant life, health, and courage to all who are in need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We praise you for the generations that have declared your power to us. Give us faithfulness to follow them, living for Christ, until you call us to join them in the joyful song around his throne. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these things and whatever else you see that we need, we entrust to your mercy. 
Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. O God of justice and love, we give thanks to you that you illumine our way through life with the words of your Son. Give us the light we need, awaken us to the needs of others, and at the end bring all the world to your feast. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Mother in God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you and lead you into the way of truth and life. Amen. Go in peace. Remember the poor.